a consideration of the relationship between Russia, America and Israel uh, right now and prior to Armageddon. And so this is going to be another opportunity for us to, to see the way uh, in which the hand of God is at work among the nations. So where do we start? Well, we start with that overarching principle that we've just read about in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And of course that overarching principle is that those who curse Israel, or curse Abraham, and therefore Abraham's seed Israel, will be cursed. And those who bless Abraham and his seed will be blessed. Now of course there's a much higher meaning uh, to that promise than what I'm going to refer to, but there's this platform, this base meaning to it as well. And we're going to see how that has played itself out uh, in recent history. History is spectacularly marked with records of nations who have supported Israel, who have prospered, while nations who have opposed Israel have been cursed. That's the way God has worked in the past. And we're going to see that, as I said, as we proceed. So what about America's relationship with Israel in the past? President Harry Truman, who became president, of course, after the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt on the 12th of April 1945, was obviously put there by God. Now, FDR was a sick man for a long time, but he didn't need to kick the bucket just then. But he did. And so Harry Truman became president. Harry Truman came from a small town in America, and he had a very good friend. In fact, he had a partner in a business who was a Jew. And his friend, the Jew, prevailed upon Harry Truman to favour the establishment of the State of Israel. And that was not an easy task, as I'll demonstrate to you. Harry Truman was instrumental in gaining statehood for Israel under the hand of God, 1947, 1948, and admission to the United Nations by uh, Israel in 1949. The Australians, by the way, also had a hand in the admission of Israel into the United Nations. The US helped Israel win three wars. The Sinai campaign of 56, the Six Day War, 67, and the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And Israel relied on US finance in the past, massively. But now, of course, Israel doesn't need the US to prop it up financially. In fact, Israel could probably help the US, who needs propping up right now. And the US, of course, can't afford to do that anymore anyway. Under President Obama, the US's relationship with Israel has sunk to its lowest level in modern history. So why has that happened and where is it going? Well, let's just consider the blessing that God brought upon the United States because of what they did, of what, what Truman did, uh, to bring about the establishment of the State of Israel under the hand of God. I have a video that I can show you showing a meeting between Truman and his Secretary of State. Now, the Secretary of State in the United States is the, apart from the Vice President, he's the most powerful politician. He's the man or woman that does the job of going around the world uh, promoting American interests and trying to resolve the world's problems, etc. Very, very powerful person. You ever heard of a, of a fellow called George Marshall? You ever heard of the Marshall Plan? that followed the Second World War. So you've got to be in my generation probably to know those things, but he was an extremely powerful man. He was a Democrat. He was, he was appointed by FDR. He, became, he was the Secretary of State during the period of Harry Truman's presidency. He opposed, George Marshall opposed the establishment of the State of Israel. And the argument was so strong between Truman and Marshall that there came a time, and I've got a video of it, that actually Marshall said to Truman that if you promote the establishment of the State of Israel, I will not be able to vote for you in the upcoming presidential election. That was held at the end of 1948. All right? He was warning him, I will not be able to support you at the election at the end of this year. You promote the establishment of the State of Israel. And Truman said, well, I am going to do that. Now, if you know anything about that history, you'll know that the 1948 US presidential election was between Harry Truman, who came to the presidency because FDR had died in, in 45. So he wasn't elected, okay? He was just put in the job. 
And he was up against a man called Thomas Dewey. Right? And one paper did the same thing as Newsweek did. When they printed their, their paper overnight, they didn't know the result of the election. And they put out on the paper a photograph of Dewey winning the election. Dewey wins. Well, of course, Dewey didn't win. Truman won. Right? And it was against the odds. Just like Newsweek put out the, their uh, Newsweek, 120,000 copies, saying, Clinton wins. Well, that's was very embarrassing, because Clinton didn't win. But everybody expected Clinton to win. Everybody expected Dewey to win. All right? He didn't. Why not? Well, for the same reason. The intervention of God. And so, there is a case there, brothers and sisters, for God's blessing this man Truman, because he supported the establishment of the state of Israel. So here he is, conferring with Abba Eban and David Ben-Gurion at that period of time. He's down there on the bottom left-hand corner of that photograph. But I want you to notice another man, because you see, these are the, these are the pictures that were taken at the time of the 1947 vote on the 29th of November. This man down here, do you, know, you recognise him? He's long since dead, but he was a long-serving foreign minister of Russia. His name was Andrei Gromyko. All right? Now, he was, he was the Kremlin's representative at the time of the partition vote on the 29th of, of November 1947. And Russia supported that vote. So... Israel was, was formed because they had the support of America and the support of Russia. Okay? Well, guess what happened? Not only was America blessed, but, but Russia was blessed. That's why they became the two superpowers of the world. God is true to his word. If he says, you, if you bless Abraham and, the, and those who belong to Abraham, I'll bless you. But if you curse them, I'll curse you. Have a look at the historical record. Find me a case where that isn't true. You won't find one. Okay? It's a very simple principle, but it's worked itself out in the history of nations. So both America and Russia were blessed. Post-World War II, America, of course, and Russia became these superpowers. Despite Russia suffering 20 million war casualties and economic ruin during that war, they were, they were right down at the bottom. But they came up because they gave support to Israel. But... When Russia supported the Arab countries in wars against Israel in 1967 and 1973, the USSR was doomed. And so it came to pass. In 1989, the wall came down. By 1992, the USSR was defunct. It was gone. Russia was a mess. Okay? You don't get away with that. Eventually, God will catch up with you. Vladimir Putin is promoting cooperation with Israel while America is distancing itself from Israel right now. Trump might change that a bit, but right now, America is distancing itself from Israel. What do you reckon that's going to lead to? Why do you think America's almost bankrupt? Yeah, that's the principle. Now, <clears throat> here's another sensitive issue. Okay? You will hear and read that America... Supports Israel because they're a young lion. That is not what our Christadelphian community taught for 100 years. Did you know that? It is not what we taught. So I want to deal with that. We need to go back to our roots, brothers and sisters. Anybody who disagrees or, or opposes what our pioneers wrote is on very thin ice, if I might use that terminology here when there's a lot of ice around. It's very thin ice. Okay? You have to have really solid biblical proof that they were wrong. And on some things they were wrong. Those that will be at the next weekend will find that there are some things that I don't agree and neither did Brother H.B. Mansfield with Brother Thomas in relation to the work of Elijah. Because we're compelled not to agree. The scripture says something different. It's not about the opinions of men. It's not about the views of men. It's about what the scripture says. But you're on thin ice. If you haven't got good scriptural proof. And there was not good scriptural proof 
for the invention of the theory that America is a young lion. So we need to get this right. Take the Punch magazine. Let's take the outsiders first. Here's the Punch magazine of 1923. Now here is the old lion Britain, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that the next door neighbours of the old lion are Australia and Canada. Okay? That's pretty good, isn't it? And you've got other nations over here. You've got South Africa and New Zealand over here. What you will not find is the United States of America. All right? Even the world knew that America was not a young lion. Okay? And we want to show that the scripture makes that plain as well. So here's the pioneers on America. Did they teach it? Well, the Logos magazine had articles and questions were asked about this. I'm actually going to quote you some pretty powerful statements from Brother Thomas. This is back in 1950. Now, they quote from the Christadelphian. Dr. Thomas was of the opinion that in the last phase of human affairs, just before the setting up of the kingdom, uh, of the coming of, of Christ, America would cooperate with Britain in her efforts against uh, the world in arms. It, they quote the fact that Brother Roberts said that America would certainly make a good young lion. He didn't believe that America was a young lion. He said they would probably make a good young lion, but they're not a, they're not a young lion. So what was he doing? Simply stating what Brother Thomas had made very, very clear. And you can go to Eureka, Volume 3, page 203, and you read this. Now, this is what they quoted in that article. It was up on the screen recently. But this is the words I want. He says, There is no symbolical revelation of events to be developed upon the American arena. There are, however, general declarations, etc. You know, he really lambasts the Americans. He talks about its idolatry of self is God-defiant and it needs to be taught that there is one almightier than the dollar and stronger than the human will. Okay? So that was the way he thought about America. And he lived in America. Okay, so his, his view of America was based upon scriptural teaching, not upon the way things appeared. And that's our problem. Because America has been such a dominant power since the end of the Second World War, we think, well, they've got to have a part. Do they? No. What does the Bible say about it? Nothing. Zero. Okay, that's the truth of the matter. But you see, what's happened is that this was perpetuated. This idea developed after the Second World War. This article here in the magazine lists America, Canada, Australia and, the, and South Africa as vigorous young lions on the basis of the English language. It does not even mention New Zealand. I thought New Zealanders spoke English. But <coughs> they're not even mentioned. I mean, we've got to be more accurate than that. So what, is, what was the origin of this view of America being a young lion? Well, a brother, an Australian brother, whose initials are there, EMS, EMS, wrote an extensive article on the origin and location of Tarshish under a banner, Eureka in the Light of Today, in Logos, Volume 23, way back in August 1957. So this is where it originates from. He was an international speaker who wrote extensively, including in the Logos, he was disfellowshipped in the early 1970s for teaching the feasibility of perfect righteousness in all men. He didn't end up in the right place. But he did create this theory that America is a young lion. So what are the qualifications to be a young lion? Well, origin, colonisation by Britain is pretty obvious. Culture and language of the parent lion, yes, we can accept that. But what does a lion represent in scripture? Well, we know. We know from places like Genesis 49, verses 9 and 10, in Jacob's prophecy concerning Judah, the lion in scripture represents governmental systems, kings, rulerships. So you've got the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ as ruler, as king of all the earth. But also there's another qualification, we believe. Because the lion is about rulership, Hence, a British parliamentary system of government with a prime minister and a cabinet is an essential element. Well, guess what countries in the world today have a British system of government and a, and a prime minister? Australia, Canada, New Zealand and India. And three of those, the first three brothers and sisters, all have 
Queen Elizabeth II as their titular head of state. That's why when you turn over your coins or your, your, your notes, there's the visage of Queen Elizabeth II on it. Okay? That's some of the qualifications to be a young lion. America does not have a British form of government. It's actually French in many ways. I want to demonstrate this to you. Now, this is... I'm going to go into some matters here. I've, I've had people's eyes glaze over on this. So this might be a time to sort of pull on the thinking cap and focus for a while. But I want to show you the history here. History is going to be repeated, as it often is. And the US will be sidelined by the Great Depression of the 21st century. America came into the First World War in April 1917. Their troops did not go into the field until July 1918, and the war ended on the 11th of November 1918. They tipped the scales, but they made virtually no impact otherwise. America didn't come into the Second World War until the Japanese bombed them on the 7th of December 1941. Did they? They didn't want to be involved in the European war. They will let Britain go down the gurgler. They didn't care about that. Until they were punched in the nose, then it was a different matter. America has a long history of standing aside while the rest of the world suffers. That is going to be repeated. So what did John Thomas say about America? Well, he was asked a question way back in January 1860. And the query was, written by a sister, she, she asked this question. In the revolutions of the world, what part has America to perform? Here's his answer. It's the first paragraph. You're just going to see the first paragraph of a four-page article in the Herald of the Kingdom, An Age to Come. Pages 107, 108 and beyond. This is where this, this paragraph comes from. Under the heading, in his answer to this question, The Destiny of the United States, he wrote, By America, in the inquiry, we presume is meant the United States. In reply, we remark that this confederacy is not represented by any prophetic symbols, nor are there any verbal predictions concerning it, after the manner of those concerning Babylon, Persia, Macedonia, Rome, the Ten Kingdoms, Russia, and so forth. So you see, he couldn't find any reference to the United States in the scripture, and neither can I. Now, if you think this is a Johnny-come-lately thing, forget it. I've been saying exactly this for the last 15 or 20 years from Bible school platforms, so it's not something that's come along lately, okay? Because there is no reference to America in the Bible. It's zero. Which means you've got to find the right place for them at the end of the days. And it will be just like the Second World War. They will stay out of it until they're brought into it. They won't go in willingly. So what about France and America? Because they've got a French form of government. Now, I'm, I'm amazed. I drive through America. I do a lot of miles in America, as you probably are aware. And the number of towns and streets named Lafayette or something similar, like Fayetteville, and with French names right up through the Midwest, I am astounded at the amount of French that there is in America. Now, you thought you were French in Canada, didn't you? You're forced to have two languages in this country. You know, when you get to the border, it's not English that's on the top, is it? it? It's the French that comes first. Anybody here speak French? So, you know, you could say, well, Canada's a bit French too. But America is even more French than Canada. Because you, in Canada, have a British form of government. All right? And you've got the Queen on your coins. America doesn't. We want to examine that. France entered the War of Independence, that is the War of Independence in America, in 1778. It bankrupted France and led to the French Revolution of 1789. Did you know that the French Revolution began because they couldn't feed their own people because they were involved in the American War of Independence? So the Americans were responsible for the French Revolution, in part. 
And the French were there in the Battle of Yorktown, the crucial battle on the James River in 1781. I've been there to the, to the, to the battleground. And you know, there's, there's, there's statues there. There is the, 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 the British commanding officer, okay? The British commanding officer uh, is there. And there's the American commanding officer and the French commanding officer. And guess what the American and the French commanding officer are doing? Holding hands. Shaking hands. Yeah. Because it was the French who won the Battle of Yorktown for the, for the Americans. The Americans were on the back foot at the time. They were being pushed south. The British were going to win that war until the French intervened. And they intervened in several ways. They, they blocked the entrance to Chesapeake Bay uh, so that the, the British could not supply their troops at Yorktown from New York. Right? So there was a lot of ways they intervened. But, and so America rewarded France by appointing as their first finance minister a Frenchman. How do I know that? Well, if you go to the White House, right next door to the White House, on the left-hand side, if you're facing the White House, is the old finance ministry. Guess whose statue is outside? The first finance minister in the government of George Washington. He was a Frenchman. They adopted a French government system. That's why they have a president, all right? That's got nothing to do with the British. In fact, they made sure that they had nothing to do with the British. And they celebrate Colonel Lafayette by a park and by a statue, which I'll show you in a minute. They accepted the Statue of Liberty from France. And that's there in the harbour of New York, is it not? They had a Frenchman design Washington, D.C. You ever been to Washington, D.C.? It's designed like, like a diamond. You know, you've got that huge open area that goes down to the Congress and you've got the Washington Monument, okay? And then on the other point of the diamond, you've got the White House. Well, a Frenchman designed that. And this man had a huge part to play in the events of the War of Independence and the formation of the form of government that America now has. His name was Colonel Lafayette. He lived between 1757 and 1834. He came from an aristocratic family. He was a military officer. He joined the American Revolution with the encouragement of the French government in, seven, in 1770s as a young man. He influenced Louis XVI, who was the the French king who had his head cut off by the guillotine, remember, to support the War of Independence. That played a, he played a crucial role in many battles against the British on American soil, especially the Battle of Yorktown. And he convinced Louis XVI to issue the Edict of Tolerance of the Huguenots in 1787 to form the Estates General. Now, if you've read the history of the French Revolution, you know that the formation of the Estates General was what brought the monarchy undone. Okay, so he had a huge part in that. So this is why the Americans, of course, celebrate him. He played a prominent part in the French Revolution. So what they have done is they've, they've created a park for him. Now there's the White House and there's the, the Washington Monument. There's the diamond I'm talking about. So you go down here, off to the left, you go down to the Congress building over here. So here you've got the White House. Well, what's out in the front of the White House? Well, there's your whatever it is, Constitution Avenue. You've got Lafayette Park. So what's in the corner of Lafayette Park? Well, right down there is a huge bronze statue, and there he is. This is Colonel Lafayette. He's a stone's throw away from the centre of American government. I wonder why. Well, because they got a French form of government. And Brother Thomas wrote this in the Herald of the Future Age, 1846. That's a long time ago, isn't it? This is before he came to a full knowledge of the truth. 1846. It is a fact that on the return of Lafayette and the French army to Europe, the American party was formed in France, which has the breath of life from God. That's a quotation from Revelation 11. The breath of life from God diffused the spirit of liberty among the French. So he's saying that what happened in America by French intervention was to have a huge influence upon what happened in France in the events of the French Revolution. It diffused the spirit of liberty among the French, which resulted in the re-proclamation of the rights of man and the abolition of the monarchy and titles of nobility in France, which of course is what Revelation 11 is all about. How much these events changed the face of human affairs 
is well known to every student of the history of the times. Well, this is why America is the way it is, brothers and sisters. So be patient with me. Just let me just add a little bit more to this. You're going to nail this down so hard that nobody's ever going to get it up off the ground. And you can do it. The United States, this is straight from the horse's mouth. You know, where, where do you get your best evidence from? Well, the people who rewrite their history or want, want you to, to read their rewritten history. So I've taken it straight from Congress, the Office of the Historian of Congress. So what do they say? When the first rumours of political change in France reached American shores in 1789, the US public was largely enthusiastic. Americans hoped for democratic reforms that would solidify the existing Franco-American alliance and transform France into a Republican ally against aristocratic and monarchical Britain. Get it? Yeah. They admit it themselves. And then there's this man, Thomas Jefferson, who became the leader of the pro-French Democratic Republican Party that celebrated the Republican ideals of the French Revolution. So what about this guy, Thomas Jefferson? Well, this is from the Library of Congress. He was recognised in Europe as the author of the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson quickly became known as a, a focal point or a lightning rod for revolutionaries in Europe and the Americas. And, of course, he was a United States Minister to France. Jefferson became an ardent supporter of the French Revolution, even allowing his residence to be used as a meeting place for the rebels led by Lafayette. Good grief. Little wonder, little wonder that America is not a young lion. They wanted nothing to do with the British. They were allied with the French. That's why they've got a French system of government. And when President Obama came to office in January 2009, he was inaugurated on the 20th of January. By February, he'd done, this is reported on the 14th of February 2009. He'd been in office for for about three weeks, a bust of the former Prime Minister of Britain, this is this man here, Winston Churchill, once voted the greatest Briton in history, which was loaned to George W. Bush from, from the government's art collection after 9-11, has now been formally handed back. But when British officials offered to let Mr. Obama hang on to the bust for a further four years, the White House said, thanks, but no thanks. You know what Obama then said in a press conference shortly thereafter? He said, France is our closest ally. Excuse me. He's right. You see, this is why. This is why John Thomas and Robert Roberts and Christadelphians for 100 years did not believe that America was a young lion or that it would play a prominent part in the events of the latter days, and they won't. Now, I used to get people mocking me when I said these things. They don't mock anymore. Because the evidence is clear. The evidence is there for all to see that our Christadelphian community was right in the beginning. And we should not have abandoned it. We had, we had a look at this passage, didn't we? Jeremiah 30, verses 12 to 14. All Israel's former allies will depart. And all that support that America gave to the development of the nation of Israel, supporting them through wars, financing their bankruptcy, all of that, brothers and sisters, has led to where we are today. America has basically forsaken Israel. Now, why have they done that? Well, they've done it because of policies like this. Now, when Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State, she had a study done right, in the State Department. This was reported on the 20th of July last year. This study was entitled, Preparing for a Post-Israel Middle East. Let me repeat that. Preparing for a Post-Israel Middle East. Let's put that in everyday language. US is preparing for a Middle East that doesn't have an Israel in it. You got it? So why not? Why, why shouldn't we have an Israel? Well, the study talk, talk, talks about that. It says, in that study, Israel was classified as the greatest threat to the US because strong US-Israeli bilateral relations hinders the US from having, an, having normal relations with Arab 
and Muslim countries, as well as increasingly the greater international community. So the answer? Get rid of Israel. Yeah. Which is why Obama has turned against them. Right. That's where it's coming from. And, of course, the Obama deal in Iran. US to protect Iranian nuke sites from Israeli attack. Now, we've had people during the election campaign say, oh, well, that's all rubbish. Israel doesn't think it's rubbish. Israel thinks that this is what happened. This is from the Jewish press on the 23rd of July. And that article said this. Obama deal explicitly states that the US and other P5 plus 1 powers, it includes Russia, by the way, can help Iran deflect and even respond to sabotage and nuclear threats to its nuclear sites. It allows Western powers to help Iran to protect its nuclear sites and possibly even to a stage a counterattack on the source of the threat. So where do you think the threat would come to on Iran's nuclear sites from? Where do you think it would come from? Israel. Yeah. And the US is basically committed. Now John Kerry was asked about this. He was asked about it. And he said, well, I'm not really sure. Which, of course, is typical of John Kerry. I'm not really sure. Read the annex. Read the annex of this document. Israel is absolutely positive about it. Which is why Netanyahu is developing his relationship with Putin. That's why. It's one of the reasons why. And there's growing cooperation between these two men. You know, when, when Russia came into Syria in September 2015, the very first thing that Netanyahu did was to ring up Putin and say, can I come and see you? And he flew to Moscow. And they made sure, these two men, that there'd be no clash between American planes and Russian... Uh, sorry, between Israeli planes and Russian planes. Has there been? Have you seen a report of Russian and Israeli planes clashing over Syria? Israel's flying over Syria all the time. So is Russia. Ever heard any report? Of course you haven't. Because they locked in an agreement that they would stay out of each other's way. All right? Netanyahu made sure of it. He believes that the, that the six key nations who made this agreement about Iran, who his sanctions on Iran, have made a historic mistake. Because, of course, we know Iran's not going to give up on the idea of developing a bomb. And so he is setting about making sure that he's got at least one friend among the six. And that friend is Vladimir Putin. And Putin is telling Netanyahu, as I'll show you in a minute, he's telling Netanyahu, you let Gazprom, which he owns, by the way, you let Gazprom come in and look after your gas fields in the Mediterranean and your oil fields, and nobody's going to touch you because we will put Russian workers on those platforms and the Hezbollah and the Hamas and the Iranians are not going to come anywhere near you. Now Netanyahu hasn't fully agreed to that yet, but he's on the way. We're going to have, brothers and sisters, an Ahaz peace deal between Russia and Israel. The latter day, Assyrian is Russia, of course, and they will resolve, like the, like the Assyrians in the time of Ahaz, temporarily resolved Ahaz's problems. So what were Ahaz's problems? Problem due north and due northeast. What's Israel's problems today? Due north. Hezbollah in southern Lebanon with 26,000 rockets that can reach the Negev. And Syria, the last nation that wants to destroy Israel on its border. Okay? It's exactly the same problems that Ahaz had. And now we're seeing Netanyahu and the Israeli government going about the same process to secure peace. Yep, it's all prophesied. That's why passages like Hosea 12 verse 1 say, Ephraim feeds on wind. And what do they do? They make a covenant with the Assyrians. Yeah, that's what they do. And they're in the process of doing it. Now this is pretty fresh news. This is the 12th of December, just five days ago. This comes from uh, the CBN News. Jerusalem, Israel. Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister says President Vladimir Putin and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu are on, ex on, are on excellent terms and speak regularly by phone. 
Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Bogdanov said, it was no exaggeration that the relationship between the two leaders is at its highest point ever. This year, bilateral contacts have been unprecedentedly intense, he said. It's a full article there. I've only quoted you just a couple of lines from it. See what's happening? Yeah. That relationship is growing every day. So what have we got in Israel today? We've got 8.18 million people in the land of Israel and 1.6 million of them are Russian Jews, most of whom who have come to Israel in the last 25 years. And there are 1.7 million Arabs or Palestinians. In May 2013, there were 10,000 Red Army, that is, the Russian Red Army veterans, men who fought against Hitler in the Second World War, living in Israel. 10,000 of them. Do the maths, as they say. The Second World, Second World War ended in 1945. If these men fought against Hitler, then it was in nine, the last, last year, it was 1945. How old are they today? How old were they in 2013? Late 80s, at the very best. Probably many of them mid 90s. Some might even be 100. There were 10,000 of them living in Israel. You reckon they got family in Russia? Yeah. So family links and visits are very strong. There's more traffic. More traffic between Tel Aviv and Moscow than there is between Tel Aviv and New York. And when you go to Israel, you see things like this. Now, this needs to go through the car wash, doesn't it, this vehicle? But you don't wash your cars. In the if you're going to the East Bank, you don't wash your cars. But it gets dented. But on this, someone here has written, maybe the owner, we don't know. I love Putin. Right? It's a common sentiment in Israel today. Common sentiment. sentiment. So Putin visited... Uh, Israel in, in June 2012 he said that his talks with Netanyahu had been detailed and very useful Shimon Peres who died a little earlier this year he was the president of Israel at the time he visited Moscow in November 2012 for the inauguration of the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Centre in Moscow Russian war, a, Russian, a huge Russian warship visited Haifa Harbour on the 13th of May 2013 and the Russians said about this there is something to be understood from this for the contemporary Middle East. Where we decided to make anchor is a clear statement, both to the Israelis and the entire region. And many of those 10,000 Jewish veterans were brought aboard that Russian vessel while it was in Haifa Harbour. Yep, there are some things happening. So why are these happening? Well, Wikipedia comments like this. It says... In 2011, Putin said Israel is in fact a special state to us. It is practically a Russian-speaking country. That might be an exaggeration, but, but there are at least 1.6 million Jews who speak Russian. Israel is one of the few foreign countries that can be called Russian-speaking, he said. It's apparent that more than half of the population speaks Russian. Putin additionally claimed that Israel could be considered part of the Russian cultural world and contended that songs which are considered to be national Israeli songs in Israel are in fact Russian national songs. He further stated that he regarded Russian-speaking Israeli citizens as his compatriots and part of the Russian world. Okay? You reckon this is nonsense? No. No. It's actually the fulfilment of Bible prophecy. It goes on. In October 2015, Israel and Russia held meetings to coordinate over Syria and avoid accidentally clashing or scrambling each other's communications while operating over the country. In March 2016, Putin said the relations with Israel were special and based on friendship, mutual understanding, and the long common history. Putin stated, Russia and Israel have developed a special relationship. 1.5 million Israeli citizens come from the former Soviet Union, he said. They speak the Russian language, are the bearers of Russian culture, Russian mentality. 
They maintain relations with their relatives and friends in Russia. And this makes the interstate relations very special. You're getting a feel for what's happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Bible said it would. And it's been happening big time in 2016. Let me just back that up. Debka, a reliable international reporting system, wrote this on the 10th of June this year. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu decided at their 7th June meeting in Moscow to deepen the military ties between the Russian and Israeli armed forces. Now, I was disappointed with Debka. You know why? There's nothing new in this at all. Because, this, they said in this article, this historic decision spells the end of the Israeli Defence Force's unique relationship with the US. Rubbish. Because, in fact, all that this was, was a renewal of a five-year agreement that had run out. Because you go back to the 6th of September 2010, and Russia and Israel signed a five-year military agreement. And in 2016 it ran out. So they renewed it. So this has been going on for a long time. And as I said earlier, the Russian leader tried to convince Netanyahu by saying that the presence of the Russian Navy and Air Force in the area would guarantee that no Arab or Muslim military force, such as those of Iran, Syria and Hezbollah, would attack the gas fields. Put Russian workers on there, Nobody's going to touch you. So what would a covenant between Russia and Israel achieve, do you think? Well, Russian control of Syria removes the last enemy among the nations surrounding Israel. All the rest are at peace with Israel. Russian domination of Iran would end the nuclear threat to Israel. That's going to happen. Any agreement would include Russian approval for Israel to eliminate Iranian-backed Hezbollah, in southern Lebanon, one of their biggest worries. Israel will annex the West Bank, as we pointed out in our first study, ancient Samaria, in fulfilment of Ezekiel 38, verse 8, and the Russians will agree with it, and so will the Americans. And the Gaza Strip becomes the homeland of the Palestinians. That's where they're going to have their state. If there is a Palestinian state, it'll be down on the Gaza Strip. And Joel 3, verse 4, and Zephaniah 2, verses 4 to 11, speak about that. So where, brothers and sisters, where will that all lead? Well, it will lead to the fulfilment of Ezekiel 38, verses 8 and 11. All I'm going to read to you, because of time, is the words in green. This is verse 8, this is verse 11. They, the Jews, brought back from the sword, they shall dwell safely, the Hebrew word means securely, all of them. And thou, go shall say, I will go to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell securely, all of them, dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Can you see how that might become a reality, given what is happening today? Yeah, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? And it can't be too far down the track. It is a land still of unwalled villages. Kibbutzim, Moshevim. And you go there, you see things like that. We tried to walk across the Valley of Jezreel once. And there's a lot of space out there. A lot of villages like that. But today, of course, around the West Bank, there's a nine metre wall. It's got to go. And it will go. And when Israel annexes the West Bank, the first thing they will do with that is bring in the big crank. It's clip lock, it's Lego. You know, it's clip lock. It's got hooks on the top. I'll just hook it up, put it on a truck, carry it out, put it on a boat, ship, take it out in the Mediterranean, it'll become a reef for fish somewhere in the, in, in the Mediterranean, probably. Yeah, it's got to go. And it will go. So, what's Mr. Trump? going to do about all this? 
Well, <clears throat> he's making appointments right now, isn't he? And one of, the, one of the latest appointments is his Secretary of State. This is the, I believe, the second most powerful position in the government of the United States of America. That's why Hillary Clinton got that job when Obama was elected in 2008. He's appointed Rex Tillerson, who is the CEO of ExxonMobil, the largest company in the world. I don't know what his salary is, but it would be squillions every year. Okay. His retirement, they say he's near retirement. You know, He could retire and live, he could live on a Caribbean island for the rest of his life and be served by thousands of people. Still wouldn't erode his pay out. So why would you want to be the Secretary of State of well, the United States of America? Well, because Donald Trump asked you. That's why. So what's this man... What does this man have a record? Well, he has one very distinct record, you know. It's listed down here. He's won award. The Russian Order of Friendship, which was awarded to him in 2013. Now, P Putin, of course, is said to have fiddled with the American election. And they're saying that because Donald Trump said that he wants to make a friend of Vladimir Putin. He thinks he can do deals with Vladimir Putin. Well, he might have appointed a man who has already done deals with Vladimir Putin. Because Putin owns Gazprom. He's the richest man in the world. $60 billion, they say. Now, he owns Gazprom. He's into oil. Interesting, isn't it? We'll have to wait and see. But this is perfect for Donald Trump, who seeks to make deals with the leader of Russia. I want to conclude now by taking you just to where this is all going to lead <clears throat> and how it's going to come out in the end, brothers and sisters. We know what's going to lead, don't we? Just create the scenario that we're seeing developing before our very eyes. That Putin and Trump make some kind of deal about Israel. And Putin convinces Trump and others and Israel that he's their protector. Just like the Pope thinks he's the protector of all Christians. Okay? Let's just say that happens. Get the idea? Of why peace will come? Yeah. Take down the walls and the bars and the gates. They'll have peace. They'll think they're secure. Just like Russia thought they were secure in 1939 and 40. You know what happened then? Hitler was on the move, wasn't he? Hitler took the Rhineland and then he took Austria and then he took the Sudetenland and then he took the rest of Czechoslovakia and they were talking about peace, peace, in our time. That idiot, Chamberlain, went over there and waved a piece of paper. We're going to have peace in our time. Idiot. He was dealing with Hitler. Right? And Hitler even deceived Stalin, of all people. On the 23rd of August, 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union signed the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact agreeing that the two countries would not attack each other. Now this is, this is about two weeks before Hitler invades Poland on the 1st of September. Okay? And he locked in the Russians. He said, we've got an agreement. And there was a secret agreement that they didn't publish. You know what that was? The secret agreement was that when Hitler attacked Poland, he'd only go up to the Vistula. He would go halfway into Poland and the Russians would come from the, from the east and they would take the other half and they would divvy it up between themselves. Right? I didn't tell the world that. And so Stalin was so confident, he was so confident that Hitler would keep that agreement that he shot his best generals because he thought that they would be competition for his leadership. And the army of Russia was in absolute ruins. But the pact was broken when Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union less than two years later on the 23rd, 22nd of June 1941. And Stalin was so shocked by that, so stunned by that, 
but he didn't appear in public for two weeks. No radio. He was always on the radio. No radio broadcast. He was a lump of jelly for two weeks, by which time, of course, the Germans were almost on his doorstep in Moscow. So, you see, it's all going to happen again, isn't it? Because the confidence that the Israelis will have in their covenant with the Russians is going to come unstuck in exactly the same way. Now, let me ask you a question. This statement here in Ezekiel 38 verse 10, At the same time shall things come into thy mind, go, and thou shalt think an evil thought. You can think many evil thoughts, but I'll tell you the most evil thought that you can have. The most evil thought that you can have is to make a solemn agreement and sign it in your own blood when you've got no intention of keeping it. And further down the track, you turn and break it. There's no more evil thought than that. And that is going to happen like it happened to Stalin. But it's going to happen to God's people. All right? The nation of Israel. Because they're so foolish that they're following the pattern of King Ahaz and don't realise it. But it's going to have a good outcome. It's going to be terribly painful. It's going to have a good outcome. So I want to conclude... With the Zionist cry under Gog. In Isaiah chapter 30 and at verse 19, we read these words. Do you recall what Isaiah 30 was about? The events of Armageddon. We read these words. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. Because they are going to cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And you can add to that Hosea chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. O Israel, return unto Yahweh thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. That's true. Take with you words and turn to Yahweh. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. Asher, Asher, is Assyria. Right. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. You know, brothers and sisters, when Gog has done its work in the land, and when Armageddon, the great earthquake, has destroyed two-thirds of of the people in the land, along with two-thirds of the population of the earth, and the entire army of Go is destroyed. There's going to be a lot of fathers. There's going to be many, many fathers. And it's these people who will pick themselves up out of the dust that will say to their God, we made a huge mistake putting confidence in Assyria, in the latter-day Assyria. They can't save us. That's the great end of this story. There's a lot in between, of course, but that's the great end. So in our next study, God willing, I know that many of you won't be here tomorrow morning because you've got other obligations, and that's good. We are recording these talks, of course, so you can always catch up. But in our study tomorrow morning, we're going to have a look at Britain and its young lions and what's happening in Europe. Some dramatic things happening in Europe. Things that are going to change the entire landscape in the next six months, by the way. So we'll have a look at the consequences of Brexit on Europe and see how the hand of God is at work in the affairs of the nations. Brothers and sisters, our redemption is drawing nigh. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word 
to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by Christadelphianvideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.